Access to safe, green spaces has the power to not only create community, but ignite hope, pride, and joy within. Let's take a moment right now. I want you to close your eyes and think about a childhood memory when you were outside. Think about where you were. Were you in a park, backyard? Did you feel safe? Do you remember the feeling of wind rushing through your hair or mud squishing in between your toes? Open your eyes now. For many children around the world, moments like these are not forming parts of their first memories. Safe, green spaces can be hard to access or cost money to enter. When I was a kid, if I wasn't outside, I was sitting by the back door begging to be let outside. It didn't matter the weather or the season. My first word, not very big surprise, was outside. One of my first memories was in the front yard of the house where I grew up in Kentucky. I would spend hours playing in this huge magnolia tree, designating each branch as another level of my playhouse. Not only did I have access to these spaces, but the privilege of parents who supported my passion for the outdoors. In a 2010 study released in the Medicinal Behavioral Annal uh, entitled Spatial Disparities in the Distribution of Green Spaces and Parks in the USA, it was discovered that communities with lower income households in urban areas are likelier to have fewer access to these green spaces and parks. And if they do, they're more likely to be further away. A clear line has been drawn between those who can and cannot have access to safe green spaces based on socioeconomic status. It was because of these realizations that when I graduated college, I decided that I wanted to be an environmental educator. But I wanted to work for an organization that would prioritize public access. After a few months of applying to jobs, I landed a position as a kindergarten teacher in Hocotenango, Guatemala. For a little bit of background, the School of Hope, where I was to be working, has a mission to break the cycle of poverty. They conduct extensive background interviews in the community to ensure that they are working with some of the highest need families in the area. I arrived in Guatemala five years ago with the intention of staying for just one. Turns out, kindergartners and I operate on similar wavelengths. <laughs> we both love putting song and dance to everyday activities, and it took only a few short months for me to fall in love with them and the community that surrounds the School of Hope. Most of my kindergartners, they lived in homes that were made from corrugated sheet metal in communities that offered little to no safe green spaces for them to play in. The mountains and farms that surrounded their neighborhoods were owned mostly by families and private companies and had entrance fees that resembled US prices. The public spaces that they did have access to were mostly made from concrete. Their school, while a very happy place, was also made from concrete. Their play area, concrete. These places can be cold, hard, and loud. But they didn't always live like this. Many of my students also had parents and grandparents that had grown up working the land in rural communities. Due to political unrest, however, many were forced to move to urban areas. And as a result, younger generations now live between mountains and forests that they themselves have never walked in. I took my students outside as often as I could. We went to the farm that backed up to the school. And when we couldn't go outside, we learned how to bring the outdoors inside by growing different types of plants. Students from other grades, street vendors, parents, Everyone would stop by the outer window of our classroom to ask how the plants were doing. Como van las plantas, they would say. How are the plants doing? Fantastic, responded one of my students. We've been singing to them. In 
In a 2013 report by the National Wildlife Federation, it was discovered that access to playing and learning outdoors actually increases children's academic performance and their overall well-being. Children that are suffering from abuse or trauma in their homes, as many of the children in this community were, often are already struggling with both of these outcomes. So I wondered, wouldn't it be cool to start a garden with these kids? And with the permission of the owner of the farm and the school, that's what I did. For the first year in the Garden of Hope, uh, we grew in between six rows, in between rows of coffee uh, with donated seeds. And this space was inspired by the community of Hokotenango. When we had more produce than we could eat ourselves, we invited others to come and picnic with us. Or we would sell our produce to the community. And with the money that we earned, we bought fans for the school's cafeteria to keep the flies off of the food. Sharing our produce and our space became fundamental to the garden. In the second year, we grew in six raised beds. And we had an outdoor classroom made from stumps and a little whiteboard that hung from a mango tree. By this time, we had developed a two-way learning exchange. I might have been in the teacher position, but my students taught me loads about local produce that I didn't know, like how to cut certain vegetables for salads, and that everything, even raw beets, tastes pretty good with limon y sal, or lime and salt. <laughs> we learned a lot, but mostly, we had a lot of fun. In 2017, we were granted access to an acre of land on the Azotea coffee farm. I immediately quit my other jobs that I had been working and dedicated myself 100% to the Garden of Hope. We were so excited, but we also knew that this was a huge undertaking. After all, the space that we occupy today, at that time, was entirely covered in coffee trees. It was going to take a full community effort to be able to transform this place into one that our neighbors would not only feel safe in, but inspired by. Luckily, in the two years leading up to this expansion, the Garden of Hope had already created a community for itself, and we were ready for this undertaking. I will never forget the day that I received a call from the school. An eight-year-old boy named Harold needed to speak with me. Now, Harold had taken a particular fondness in the garden. When he had extra time on the school computers, he actually made vegetable PowerPoint presentations and had his teachers send them to me. <laughs> so when I got this call, I dropped what I was doing, hopped on my bike, raced over to the school to see what was going on. After only a few minutes of being in the main office, Harold comes in. He had been watching for me, and apparently that morning, upon entering school, he had gone directly to the main office and had demanded to speak with me. When he saw me, he reached into his pocket, and he pulled out a wad of tissue, wrapped in red thread. Inside were six loquat seeds that he had collected, well, after eating a few loquats with his little sister. Whoa, I said, not really knowing where this is going. <laughs> Miss, he said, and he looked up to me with such desperation. He was like, Miss, we need compost now. <laughs> this moment was huge for me. Not only had this little boy learned something in the garden, but he had taken it home, and it was so important to him. This was the dream, and it was a moment when I realized that all of the hard work that we were putting in was absolutely worth it. There we go. Um, as one of the few green spaces that our community does have access to, we knew that it was also our responsibility to lead by example in regards to sustainability. So we chose permaculture, a garden design technique and philosophy to help us ensure that we were growing healthy, happy produce without using any harmful chemicals or fertilizers. Permaculture is all about finding patterns that you see in nature, learning from them, and then repeating them. The end goal is that you create uh, efficient, resilient ecosystems made from diverse communities of humans, plants, um, other animals, fungi, and bacteria that live in harmony. Obviously, this can be applied to a garden. 
but it can also be applied to an organizational structure. The Garden of Hope, for example, is run as a social business and not a traditional nonprofit or NGO. The rationale behind this is that we want to eventually create a self-sustaining community project that can be locally run and funded in order to ensure that our community space is accessible for everyone we charge for our classes and workshops for other schools and our products based on a scaled pricing system organizations pay what they can pay and in this way our community space has become known to families and students of a wide variety of backgrounds. On our community volunteer days, which we host once a month, there we are, <laughs> all of these people can come together. They are our favorite days of the month, and students are constantly asking to know the date of the next community volunteer day, and if they can bring their pets with them. On the day of, they'll show up an hour early with their entire family. And it's not unusual to see mothers sitting in the shade, relaxing, painting, grandmothers shovel in hand, helping prepare garden beds or filling pots, fathers harvesting herbs for the kitchen, or students from different schools working together to build bug hotels, like this one. <laughs> At the end of these days, we all eat a snack together, and everyone goes home with some of the produce that we harvested that day, and having made some new friends while playing outside. Not long ago, in the garden, which is located just 50 yards from where we are sitting right now, the woman on the right approached me. She is the grandmother of a family who has come to almost every single one of these community volunteer days. Her granddaughter was actually in my kindergarten class. And on this particular day, she approached me. She pulled me aside. And with tears in her eyes, she told me how much she loved the garden. She explained to me that she loved it because it brought her back to her childhood. Before it was unsafe for her to live in the countryside, she used to love helping in the garden and playing outdoors in nature. She grabbed both of my hands in between hers, all four caked in earth from working in the garden, and she thanked me and the Garden of Hope team for creating a space that not only brought her back, but was able to provide this same joy for her grandchildren. I want to take a moment. I want you to close your eyes again. I want you to tap into that memory that you had in the beginning of this talk when you were outside. And I want you to think about how you felt. Were you safe? Did you experience joy? Were you with loved ones? Open your eyes. Can you imagine what your life would be like if you didn't have moments like these in your memory? And the opportunity to access safe green spaces is something that we absolutely have to share with those who do not have this. After all, as the human population grows on Earth, we cannot afford to lose what contact we have left with nature. The point of this talk is not that everyone go out and start community gardens. Although, don't get me wrong, that would be very cool. <laughs> it is, however, that we all take a vested interest in supporting and advocating for local movements that are creating or protecting these spaces, be they public parks or nature reserves or community gardens, because they connect us to the earth, because they connect us to each other, and because they create hope. Thank you.